Today's episode on Freak Quantum Physics. Quantum Physics and the Observer. First a quick summary then an in-depth discussion with philosopher of science Simon Friedrich about the double slit experiment, stay tuned after Simon's discussion for a breakdown of the Copenhagen interpretation from Paul Sutter, host of Ask a Spaceman. For now, let's begin with a look at the observer in physics. One of the most surprising discoveries of quantum physics is that reality only exists when it is observed. That literally, particles do not exist until they are observed. Years ago, it was popular to believe in the somewhat bummer idea of reality being a deterministic program playing itself out. Light is scattered by electrons and bounced off electrons. The famous double slit experiment ruled out determinism. Famous physicist John Wheeler, he's the guy who came up with the term black hole, says that reality is made of information, which is created by observation. The observation must be made, he says, by something conscious. And Nobel Prize winner Frank Wilczek said that quantum theory is contentious and obscure, and that it will remain that way until someone constructs, within the formalism of quantum mechanics, an observer. A model entity whose states correspond to a recognizable caricature of conscious awareness. An entity. An observer. So Frank Wilczek is basically talking about an entity, not necessarily a human being or an animal, that is capable of generating information by observing and measuring. But what would that conscious entity be? Well, we definitely know that consciousness exists in the universe. I mean, at least in us humans, right? I mean, I'm conscious, you're conscious, he's conscious, I think. I'm conscious! Consciousness relates deeply to physics in ways not yet fully understood. In fact, consciousness is kind of like one of the least understood things in all of science. Nobody knows exactly what it is. Weird, right? No one really understands quantum physics. Not even quantum physicists. Quantum theory is the basis of modern-day physics. In a way, it's the language for all more specific theories of fundamental physics. We have to use it when we want to predict and explain the behavior of the most basic things that we know. Atoms, for example, and their ingredients, the elementary particles such as electrons. Today, I will talk about something that is rather strange about this theory. Quantum theory is not just about some weird niche phenomena. In fact, its practical importance is huge. For example, it explains why light particles can create electricity in a solar panel. You need it to explain how the parts of a computer work, and ultimately, the computer itself. Quantum theory is a fantastic recipe for predicting and explaining what we can measure and observe. For instance, the numbers that appear on the displays of measurement instruments in physics labs. Often, as we will see, these predictions are strikingly different from what we would have expected based on our everyday experiences. Simply said, how we expect the world to behave from what we can see with our eyes is not what actually happens on a very small scale. We know from all these observations in labs that quantum theory works, in fact, fantastically works. But in a sense, we don't know how it works and why it works. In what follows, I will tell you about the philosophy of quantum theory. I will tell you what makes quantum theory so intriguing. And I will outline three possible types of responses to the mysteries of quantum theory. In physics, we often describe things in terms of laws of nature. For example, that an apple falls from a tree or that the Earth moves around the Sun, can all be derived from the law of gravity. In a way, because quantum theory is the framework for the most fundamental laws of nature that we know, the laws of everyday physics somehow also depend on it. In everyday physics, billions of billions of billions of basic quantum objects are involved. 
An object, like a table, is made up of tiny quantum particles. But to see what is so weird about quantum theory, it is best to look at situations where individual particles are involved, one by one. Then we can see how different the laws of quantum theory really are from the laws of everyday life. Let's look at a famous experiment, which is called the double slit experiment. This experiment shows how quantum objects, particles such as electrons, behave differently from, for example, tennis balls. We have a screen, and before it is a wall with two openings or slits. Particles, for example, electrons, are fired from one side against the wall. Some go through the slits. Those will end up on the screen behind the wall, where they will be detected. When we hear about elementary particles, we might think of something like mini tennis balls, and we might expect those particles to behave like tennis balls. Now, when you do fire tennis balls at a wall with two open slits, you would expect them to end up clustering on the screen again behind the slits. But for elementary particles, this is not at all what happens. When elementary particles are going through the wall with the two slits, and when they are detected on the screen, they form a sort of wave pattern on the screen. This is really not what we would have expected. It seems as if some balls cancel each other out and others somehow reinforce each other. In a way, as we see, the particles collectively behave like a wave, a bit like when you throw a pebble into the water and see ripples on the surface. And quantum theory predicts this wave pattern perfectly. Until now, things are remarkable, but not paradoxical or mysterious. This changes when we ask, for an individual particle, through which slit did it go? Where exactly did it travel before it was detected on the screen? Quantum theory itself, successful as it is, just doesn't answer this question. You might think, let's find out by installing little particle detectors at the slits. But now a funny thing happens. As soon as we do that, the particles all of a sudden don't behave as a wave anymore. We now know which particle was detected at which slit. But now they behave like regular tennis balls without any waves. So this doesn't help us answer our original question. What happened with an individual particle in the original setting when we did not look or measure? Where exactly was that particle? In a way, it seems as if nature wants to keep that a secret from us. Philosophers and some physicists, when they are in the mood for philosophy, want to know what on earth are the particles doing while we are not measuring them? How do they behave? Broadly, there are three options to react, three different kinds of philosophical answers to this question. The first answer is called anti-realism. According to anti-realism, things do have properties when we measure them, but not otherwise. A tennis ball is there when we look, and it has certain properties. It is round, it is yellow, it sits in my hand, and so forth. The idea here is that quantum objects only have such properties when we, in some sense, look at them. In other words, according to anti-realism, there is no objective reality where things actually exist without anyone seeing, perceiving, or measuring them. Applied to the double slit experiment, anti-realism says that when we don't measure at the slits, the particle, an individual particle, just did not go through any of the slits at all. A sentence such as, the particle went through slit one, or the particle went through slit two, is meaningless according to anti-realism. Don't worry if this still sounds a bit unclear. The main problem with anti-realism is precisely that it tends to be a bit unclear. I myself developed and defended a version of anti-realism some years ago but I now find it a bit too unclear myself. I would love to see a crystal clear articulation of anti-realism about quantum theory, but I'm simply not aware of any. The second answer is called many worlds. It says that every particle, in some sense, goes through both slits, though, to put it somewhat crudely, in different branches of reality. The idea here is that 
there are countless such branches of reality, not just two as shown here. Many of my colleagues really like this interpretation because this is sort of what you get when you just read quantum theory in the literal sense at face value. But in my view and in that of some other colleagues of mine who are also critical of many worlds, this interpretation cannot really explain how quantum theory works so well because there is no room in this interpretation for probabilities. Finally, the third answer is that, as one would have expected, every particle goes through exactly one slit, even if we don't know which particle through which slit. This answer seems to be the most natural. The great physicist Alvin Schrödinger once proposed a thought experiment to show that this answer had to be right. The thought experiment is known as Schrödinger's cat. A cat is placed in a box with a bottle of poison. At any time, whether the poison is released depends on some random quantum process. For instance, the poison might have a probability of 50% of being released within an hour. And whether or not this happens is completely random. So whether the cat is dead or alive depends exactly on whether that quantum process happens within that hour or not. Now, when the cat is in the box with a poison for an hour, and we open the box after that hour, there is a 50% chance that we find the cat dead. But what should we say about the state of the cat before we looked? That will depend on which of the three options considered before we choose. If we choose anti-realism, we will have to say that the cat is neither alive nor dead before we look. It is simply not in a definite physical state at all until we see or measure it. If we choose many worlds, we have to say that it is both alive and dead, but in different branches of reality. Schrodinger's point was that only what I here call the third option is reasonable, that there is one single objective reality and that the cat is either alive or dead in it at any time. We simply do not know whether it is dead or alive. At this point, it may surprise you to hear that most of my colleagues are actually not fans of this third option. And their main reason is, for this interpretation of quantum theory to work, we must assume that there are some really weird cause-effect relations, weird in terms of time and space. One option is to suppose that there is action at a distance. What we do here on Earth can have an immediate causal effect anyway, say, on the Moon, or even in a distant galaxy, and even if there is no transfer of any stuff or material from here to there. Another option is to suppose that sometimes, crazily, causes can come after their effects. In other words, that sometimes, without being aware of it, we causally sometimes influence the past. If one wants to adopt the third answer, that there is only a single reality where we don't know if the cat is dead or alive or through which slit, which particle went, then one has to accept at least one type of such weird cause-effect relationships. My research focuses on what the most attractive option is here. What worries many physicists about these weird types of cause-effect relationships is they may clash with Einstein's famous theory of relativity. And this is our best theory of space and time. Relativity theory by itself doesn't say anything about cause and effect relationships, but the picture of time and space that it offers is just not easy to combine with the idea of action at a distance or with the idea of influencing the past. I myself am currently developing an alternative version of the third answer, but it is still a bit unclear whether that version will work. My hope is that it will turn out to be in harmony with relativity theory. So, why is quantum theory so fascinating and mysterious from a philosophical point of view? And why is it fair to say that actually no one really understands quantum physics, not even the quantum physicists? Quantum theory helps us make fantastic predictions, which have led to great technological advancements. Some of these predictions are really surprising. Think of the wave pattern on the screen behind the double slit. Apparently, physical objects at the most basic level are very different from the more familiar objects in our everyday lives. But 
the really puzzling question is what happens to the particles when we don't look. No one has so far presented an answer that has convinced the majority of us who are working on this problem. In that sense, no one really understands quantum physics. There's two separate behaviors of this wave evolution. There's the deterministic normal physics evolution according to the Schrodinger equation, and then there's this instantaneous collapse of the wave function that leads to a single particle resulting at a particular location on a screen or at an energy level in our experiment. That's weird. That's weird. Why should physics, why should this physical system care whether, whether we are observing it or not, care whether we are measuring or not, uh, care whether it's evolving one way and then another? Like this just seems weird and it's one of, the, one of the biggest flaws or shortcomings of the Copenhagen interpretation. So what if we took a different path? And this path is called the many worlds interpretation and traces its origin to the work of Hugh Everett, a physicist who developed the idea in the 1950s. He said, instead of taking two separate behaviors for the wave function. There's one behavior, it follows the Schrodinger equation when we're not looking, and then it collapses when we are looking. What if we took that away? What if we solved the measurement problem? by just getting rid of the measurement problem. What if the wave never goes away? What if it always evolves according to the Schrodinger equation? What if it just happens? What if we take away that collapse of the wave function when we get a result? What if it simply just vanishes? What if measurement isn't all that special? What if what we call a measurement is just yet another quantum interaction? And at the subatomic level, that makes perfect sense, right? If an electron hits a screen, I, in the Copenhagen interpretation, we call that a measurement. But really, it's one quantum particle, an electron, interacting with all the quantum particles in the screen. And then the screen is sending an electrical signal, which is another set of quantum particles, and representing it on some display or some graph, which is made of atoms, which are all quantum quantum particles. And then those that display, photons come off of that display. Those are quantum particles. They hit my eye, they hit the electrons in my brain. Like it's all quantum particles. The entire chain of measurement is really just a series of quantum particles interacting with quantum other quantum particles. There's no measurement. There's nothing special. And this is one of the biggest attractions to the many worlds interpretation, which is it gets rid of this nasty problem of measurement that quantum systems behave differently when we are measuring them. And really it's just quantum particles obeying the Schrodinger equation, evolving in time, and then that's it. What do you get from that? What, how does this solve the measurement problem? Well, when you have quantum particles interacting, what you end up with is entanglement. When two quantum particles in, interact with each other, their wave functions overlap, and then you have a single unified wave function that describes those two particles simultaneously. So in the act of measurement, the electron hits the screen, the electron entangles with the atoms in the screen, and then the atoms in the screen entangle with the electrons flowing down the electrical wire, and then those entangle with the display, which entangle with the photons, which entangle with my eyeballs, which entangles with all the uh, various uh, chemicals and atoms in my my brain and it's all entangled. And then my brain is entangled with the rest of my body. My body is entangled with the floor. The floor is entangled with the earth. The earth is entangled with all the radiation coming and going from the earth. And it, and it, and it turns out that everything in the universe is entangled with everything else in the universe. This means that there isn't one wave function for this particle and one wave function for this particle, and one wave function for this particle. No, there's a single wave function that describes all particles in the entire universe. When you follow this many worlds approach to its full conclusion to solve the measurement problem, what you end up with is a series of quantum particles interacting with other quantum particles. And when they interact, they share a joint wave function. So you end up with a single wave function 
that describes the entire universe. You have a universal wave function. Now, there's something funky about quantum measurements, which is you never know exactly what you're going to get. When you shoot an electron at a screen, it might go this way and it might go this way. And that's random, that's probabilistic. So how do you recover the, the different experiences that we have if it's all just deterministic, ran, uh, a deterministic movement of particles obeying the Schrodinger equation? How do you get these random results? Well, one way to view it is that if there's this single wave function for the entire universe, when this quantum particle evolves, some parts of its wave function end up over here, and some parts of its wave function over here. And so our experience of this event is that one version of us sees the particle land over here, and then another version of us sees the particle land over here. We get different parallel universes because we have a single wave function that describes the entire universe, and it ends up getting chopped off every time there's a random event, every time there is an experiment or a splitting or some sort of quantum interaction that can lead to multiple possible results, there's a single wave function that encompasses all of the possible results. They just get subdivided into their own little uh, pocket or parallel universes or worlds. These are the worlds of the many worlds interpretation. And so if you want to get rid of the measurement problem in quantum mechanics this way, you have to accept two things. You have to accept that there is a universal wave function that entangles all particles throughout the universe, and you have to accept that there are different worlds with each world having its own result from every single quantum experiment. Now this sounds very attractive and many physicists and, and non-physicists are very interested in this idea. It does, just like the Copenhagen interpretation, have its own shortcomings. Let's say I put you in a box and I set up some quantum process like the radioactive decay of some isotope. It doesn't matter, the, the details don't matter, but there's a 50-50 chance. 50% chance that it will release a poison gas and you'll die. That's right, I'm turning you into Schrodinger's cat. 50% chance you'll live. Would you take the bet? Of course you're going to say no. That's stupid. Okay, let's sweeten the deal. Uh, let's say if you live, I give you a billion dollars. And I literally have a billion dollars. Like you can, you can see it. I've got the briefcases full of, of unmarked $100 bills. They're all crisp, but you can verify. You checked with the treasury. It's all, it's all valid. There is a room full of a billion dollars right there. You just have to go in a box, spend the night, and I'll do this when you're asleep so you don't suffer anything. There's no pain or anything. You'll just go to sleep like normal. And either you will die in your sleep or you will wake up a billionaire. Would you take the bet? Probably not. And even if you did take the bet, you would be worried about it. You would be concerned about it because you're like, yeah, there's a 50-50 chance, 50% chance I'll die. Yeah, there's a 50% chance I'll wake up a billionaire, but there's a 50% chance I'll die in my sleep. Why is that bet so uncomfortable? Because the probability of you dying seems real. It seems like you have to grapple with it. It seems like you have to contend with this very real possibility that you will die. Now there's a very real possibility that you'll be a billionaire, but you can't get around the fact that there's a very real possibility that you'll die. But in the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, Every universe is realized. Every quantum possibility becomes its own universe. So if we were to perform this experiment, put you in the box, do the decay of the radioactive isotope, it doesn't matter, 50-50 chance, in one universe you die. You do not wake up in the morning. In the other universe you do wake up and you are handed a billion dollars. You won't be around to experience the universe that you die in. You're, you're literally dead. You will not wake up. You will only, you personally will only experience the universe where you do wake up and become a billion dollars, a billionaire. You're guaranteed to wake up in a universe, a billionaire. You are guaranteed in the many worlds interpretation. You will close your eyes, wake up, 
and be a billionaire. You are guaranteed to do that because there is a guaranteed outcome that that will happen. The other one of you, the other universe, the, the copy of you that died, you don't, you're not around to experience it. So you're guaranteed to wake up a billionaire. So why don't you take the bet? Why hasn't anyone taken the bet? Why? This is one of the difficulties with the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is how do you go from the probabilities of quantum mechanics and, and the fact that these probabilities and the randomness appear to be real, how do you square that with the fact that there are guaranteed outcomes? How do you link that? In quantum mechanics, the probabilities appear as just a postulate, as just, yeah, the universe is random, get over it. In the Copenhagen interpretation, interpretation, that's how it's handled. It's just, yeah, the universe is random. Move on. Stop worrying about it. But the many worlds interpretation doesn't have that option because it doesn't have the mechanism for generating the probabilities built into the interpretation itself. Now, people have worked on it, uh, but there's been no universally agreed upon satisfactory answer for how do you get probabilities out of a process that only seems to generate guaranteed results. How do you recover the Born Rule of quantum mechanics? How do you recover uh, the probability distributions that we are able to measure as a, a, an apparent facet of reality from this concept of constantly splitting universes? And speaking of these uh, constantly splitting universes, on one level, it's cool to think about the many worlds interpretation. Uh, think about any choice you've made. Think about any random thing that's ever happened to you. It's cool to think that somewhere out there, in some abstract sense, there is a version of you that is making the other choice, that went to that other college, that asked that person out on a date, that uh, you know stood up to that bowl, you know, whatever, that that had you know spaghetti for dinner instead of meatloaf. Like there's a version of you that is experiencing those parallel lives, and that's pretty cool to think about. But that's not the end of it in the many worlds interpretation. In many worlds interpretation, every quantum interaction is leading to this splitting of a universe. So it's not just your choices that are leading to different universes. Every fusion reaction in the core of the sun relies on the probabilities of quantum mechanics and there are different choices that how those fusion reactions can, can unfold. Every single one of those is leading to its own copy of a universe. If I get in my car and drive to the grocery store, in my engine of my car, there are countless quantum mechanical interactions that depend on probabilities. And yeah, the probabilities are, or the different actions, the different choices are inconsequential. A particle goes left instead of right, goes up here instead of down there. But every single one of those options becomes realized in the many worlds interpretation. And not just for that engine during that trip, but it creates an entire copy of the whole entire universe. Every single quantum interaction leads to a splitting of the entire cosmos. So right now, as you are listening to this, every quantum act action happening throughout the universe, every fusion reaction in every single star, Every collision of air molecules, every computation being performed in the semiconductors of your electronic device, every single one is leading to its own copy of the universe. So you yourself are being split into quadrillions of copies every single picosecond. The numbers are, are almost unimaginable. Every quantum interaction happening throughout the universe is leading to a complete split of the entire universe and it's happening all the time. Now, we can't use this to say many worlds interpretation is wrong. It, it seems a little weird, but you know what? There's weird stuff happening with the Copenhagen interpretation too. But it does take a certain level of, uh, of commitment to the idea that there are these constantly branching universes, that there isn't just a version of you that had spaghetti instead of meatloaf, 
last night for dinner, there are right now a trillion upon trillion upon trillion copies of you being made right now where the only difference between the universe is that some random particle in the Andromeda galaxy went this way instead of that way. And otherwise the universes are completely the same. That's a lot. And it makes you wonder how you can maintain a continuity of consciousness because our experience of the natural world takes time to unfold and process. But if our selves are our, our own conscious experience is being split constantly every single second, how do we maintain that through line? How do you maintain the sense of you even though you are constantly being split all the time? Again, this doesn't like rule out the many worlds interpretation, but it does show that the many worlds interpretation has weaknesses just like the Copenhagen interpretation. And that's the way it is. Quantum mechanics is challenging. I hope you have enjoyed this episode of Freak Physics. Please like, share and subscribe to help Freak Physics continue to provide free content. To see more go to freakphysics.com.